I'd like to welcome you all uh, once again this afternoon to the APAS Prairie Agricultural Carbon Summit. Our first presentation this afternoon uh, will be a panel examining the response of industry to carbon in agriculture. Like last night, we ask that you save your questions for our panelists until after both have spoken. Our first panelist is Ben Voss. Interestingly enough, he's president of Morris Industries Limited. Ben accepted as his position as president at Morris in September of 2015. Morris is one of Saskatchewan's most successful manufacturing companies, producing innovative farm equipment that is sold and exported worldwide. Mr. Voss is a graduate of agriculture and agricultural and biosource engineering from the University of Saskatchewan and the director's education program from the ICD Rotman. He also has a long history of entrepreneurial know-how with over 18 years of experience in owning and operating businesses in Saskatchewan. Ben lives in Saskatoon and with his family and is a fourth generation owner of a grain farm near Spiritwood, Saskatchewan. And I'm going to uh, then also introduce our second panelist this time. Uh, our second panelist is Karen hogan Casera, uh, and she is from Varesco Solutions. Karen has over 25 years of experience leading ecosystem goods and service policy and program development. She has also worked to build tools and infrastructure for environmental assets, most uh, concretely in carbon credit trading. Over the course of her career, Karen has provided strategic policy and program development input to Alberta's Programming Environmental Farm Plan, BMP manuals, and agricultural policy frameworks. To support these initiatives, Karen has coordinated research and studies of environmental mitigation opportunities for agriculture in air, water, soil, and biodiversity. During her tenure with Alberta Agriculture and Forestry, she developed the infrastructure and protocols necessary to support carbon credit trading in Alberta from 2007 to 2009. Karen and her firm help companies navigate the nexus between lowering their carbon footprint and developing an overall sustainability strategy. So let's give a warm welcome to Ben and Karen. She's going to make a dramatic entrance. Sure. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, and uh, I'm just going to start with a real brief story. I, uh, I like telling stories. I grew up on a farm. So uh, my first experience with Morris is uh, kind of a safety moment. And... Uh, for those that have worked on farms most of their lives, they know that every once in a while there's a little skin comes off. And uh, when I was three years old, I got bitten by Morris in a unique way. So I had uh, decided that the spring on the uh, trip looked attractive and I put my hand on it like that. And uh, my grandpa lifted the uh, cultivator out of the ground and the spring went like this. And my finger was in between the coils and I now have a scar on the end of my, if you can't see it real well, but scar on the end of my finger here that's got the Morris logo in it. <laughs> I did. Interesting, I, I didn't know that it was a Morris until a month ago when my dad told me that. And then I'm working at Morris and I think, you know, that's kind of relevant. I, I, I somehow, it's in my blood now. I, a bit of paint in there, I guess. But So I'm happy to be here and it's good to be uh, part of this topic. I think it's very relevant and, and we were very pleased to, to sponsor it when APAS approached us. So. I'm going to uh, try to talk mostly about the things that we're doing as a company to help farmers address uh, their carbon footprint and be more energy efficient and more efficient overall. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about some things we're doing with renewable energy, which, I, you know, you look at Morris, you think of the rod weeder, seeding equipment, air seeders, you think, what do we have to do with renewable energy? But we actually are quite involved in projects across the U.S. and Canada. Uh, related to the cellulosic ethanol business and uh, our equipment is used to haul the feedstock. So we're 
we're quite in, invested in this in this space, uh, and we, we see a lot of potential in it. Which button do I push? Big green one. Okay. So uh, the video gave you a nice little background and, and history of Morris, but you know our 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 vision is to assist the farmer. We're here to equip the farmer with with the tools they need to be productive. And we're looking to make sure we are always providing the leading edge uh, technology. You saw about the history. I mean, uh, you know, it's great to work for a company that's nearly 100 years old and having started out uh, in Saskatchewan. And today we're now, you know, most of our product goes out of Saskatchewan, uh, whether it's Australia or Russia or, or even across Western Canada, the United States. So the, the innovation in Saskatchewan is very significant and we were just a small part of that. When you look at how many egg manufacturers are based here, the ideas that come from farmers typically and are then turned into very successful companies, it's, it's a great thing. And when I went into engineering, it was uh, hard to stray too far from agriculture. It's a, it's a very exciting business. It's got lots of risk, it's got lots of issues, but it is, in my view, it's one of the most exciting businesses to be into. So I'll start with this, because I, I think there's three things that I feel are most critical when we're looking at greenhouse gas emissions and, and the carbon economy and how we can mitigate the impacts. And when I grew up, you know, one of the most common things we do when we had a problem like this, so you can see the top picture, that's an unharvested canary seed from last fall, which was not an uncommon problem because of the fall we had. The matches would have come out, right? That would have been the first solution to that. Let's burn it, release a massive amount of carbon and nitrogen, and then we can seed into it. But with tools like this, you don't have to burn it. You can seed directly into that unharvested crop, and the picture below shows you the lentils emerging from that field. And this is in Eston, and they did not have a lot of rain this spring. And because that unharvested crop was a mat on top of the surface, there was nice moist soil underneath. And so it got some not bad emergence coming out of that soil. So interestingly enough, if he had burnt it, probably wouldn't have had the moisture and probably wouldn't have got that emergence. So it takes some very tough equipment to go right through uh, an unharvested crop and not plug and not cause a lot of issues. So we feel that this is a this is a key piece. If you can equip the farmer with the tools, and maybe prevent some plowing, prevent some burning, that, that's going to help with greenhouse gas reduction. So this is one small example. The other second one that I think is absolutely critical in agriculture is fertilizer placement. So if you look at uh, where does greenhouse gas emissions come from? And I'm sorry I didn't hear all the presentations today, but nitrogen loss efficiency is certainly one of the main culprits. And getting that nitrogen in the ground and sealed off so it is not gonna evaporate or convert to uh, a greenhouse gas is critical. So the design of the opener and the placement of this fertilizer is, is, is our, in our view very important. It not only links to the yield that the farmer's gonna get, but it is gonna to link to whether that fertilizer stays in the soil. So, you know, we've put a huge amount of our research and development into that. How do you place a large amount of fertilizer in the ground next to the seed so you get the optimal yield, but don't lose the fertilizer? You paid a lot of money for it, why do you wanna evaporate it? But further, when you evaporate it, you're gonna lose it as a greenhouse gas potentially. So this is another message, that I guess, is that we feel a big part of our R&D going forward is gonna be linked to this. Secondarily, it's gonna be linked to energy efficiency. So how do you get the seed and fertilizer in the ground using less diesel? So draft horsepower to pull the seeding equipment through the field. How can we get that down, cover as many acres as possible, but not have to require the massive horsepower? And we think there's only a few ways you can do that. You improve the way the, the soil engagement tools go in the soil, but you also build better equipment that's, that's lighter and stronger that just doesn't take that same amount of fuel to pull it. And I mean, you look at what's going on, we had the wettest conditions in the Northeast and the driest conditions in, in other parts of the province. I mean, you can't have uh, equipment getting stuck and being not strong enough. It'll break, so we keep that in mind. 
but the energy efficiency piece, we're hearing it more and more and more from farmers as they, you know, I can buy a 100 foot or 90 foot drill, but I don't have an 800 horsepower tractor to pull it. And even if I did, I'd be burning ridiculous amounts of fuel. You know, in Australia, we have farmers that are covering 40 to 50,000 acres each spring with our equipment. And they're actually going to smaller equipment and more units. And the reason for that is energy efficiency. These guys work in the margins. They are, they are the highest risk taking farmers I've ever seen in my life. They don't have the, the support programs that we have. They're covering massive territories and they're dealing with weather extremes like I've never seen. And they would rather get four 40 foot drills than two 80 foot drills. And they've, they've run the math, the extra tractors, the extra equipment is for them a better economic case than larger. So it, it raises an interesting debate about whether we're gonna go back to smaller equipment than bigger. Uh, we're ready for both, but I think ultimately it's, it's an interesting dialogue on that. So, you know, these, these are some pictures that our customers sent in this year, and we think, given the tough spring we've had, when you can get these kinds of, of plant counts and, and canopy covers and get the high germination happening while conserving moisture and conserving your nutrients, it's, it's the optimal way to, to produce the crops we have in our conditions. Um, the next part that, that we think is very critical is uh, managing the inputs into the field. So huge, huge change in, in farming now is on you know, overlap control and GPS controlled equipment. So if you can reduce the, uh, the inefficiency of fertilizer use, you're gonna not only save money, but that's also gonna result in a greenhouse gas reduction. So you, know, you look at fields like this, where you're going around potholes, you're going around creeks, you're going around wet spots, you think about how much you overlap when you're doing that and you double up the amount of fertilizer and seed, all that's costing you money. And if you're going to farm large acreages, it doesn't take long for that to be in the tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So, you know, having the equipment enabled to reduce that overlap is, is really important. So we call it sectional control or in input control technology. That's what allows you to reduce that 7 to 10 percent of your input cost is by you know, that wedge on that corner of that field, normally the whole machine be on and you'd be overlapping a significant amount and doubling up the inputs. So having that sectional control allows that to be reduced. That's probably now a, a very, very guaranteed way for a farmer to, to be more efficient, is just by using GPS technology to control their inputs and eliminating that doubling up. And that's a proven area, I think, uh, in, in the science that says if you don't have that excess nitrogen, you're not going to volatilize, you're going to have a reduction in greenhouse gas. The, the last point, and then I'll be on time, I hope, is our, our role in biomass. And I, uh, I mentioned it earlier that we've been quite involved in this. And uh, this is just a, a picture of one of the projects in the U.S. There's three that we've been involved in. So they're taking corn stover, wheat straw, baling it with these big square balers, gathering it up, pulling it into that plant, and then making cellulosic ethanol. So those three have been running for a couple of years now. They've had their ups and downs. They've been, they've been sort of pilot to commercialization phase, and that's gonna result in some learning. But I think the, the general view is, is they're reaching that point where they're viable. And uh, now we're involved in a project in Sarnia, Ontario, with, with a, a producer cooperative that is going to take the same feedstocks and they're actually going to make a sugar out of the, instead of ethanol, they're just taking it to the sugar stage and the sugar is going to go into various other industries. So it's a kind of a fascinating uh, science into that, a Comet Biorefining, another group of companies have, have come up with this. But, you know, when you make these square bales on a field, you got to get them off right away, not only because the farmer wants to be able to get active in their field operations right after harvest, but the quality of the feedstock has to be protected. So we make a bale hauler, which you saw earlier in the slides. It's called, we call it a 16K, and it's a, it's a rapid uh, pickup and, and moving system for these large square bales. And so every time you build a factory like that, you gotta get about 50 of those wagons to move bales from a 50 kilometer radius and centrally locate all that inventory. So we, we've been an indirect commercial beneficiary of these initiatives because when you build a, 
ethanol plant that uses biomass, you happen to need equipment. And so we're seeing the, the benefits out of what is essentially green tech, you know, environmentally driven technology leading to then investments in agriculture, which is helping us. So I guess that, that's a pretty neat reason why we support the green tech side, because, you know, it results in sales. Uh, but I, I'll stop there. If you have any questions, though, I'm happy to talk about it. It's a kind of a personal passion of mine, the, this space, as Karen knows, I go way back in the carbon economy days, but I'm happy to, happy to talk more. So thanks for the time. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen Hogan Cazera. It's actually got a K in front of it, uh, Cazera. I think in the, the brochure it, it says Ozera. Um, shout out, a big shout out to APAS and their sponsors for convening this conference. It's a timely conference. These conversations have to be taking place. People have to get engaged and understand what's happening and where we're heading on this, this important area. So the title of my talk, Enhancing, Enabling Carbon Equity on the Farm, Building the Biological Bridge. And I, have, I wear two hats today coming to speak to you. One is my company. Um, the second one is a new entity that was formed last week, Biological Carbon Canada. And I'll talk a little bit more about Biological Carbon Canada as I get through uh, the slides. So what do we do? Well, I've been around since Brian and John working on creating opportunities. Um, for carbon credits um, and other EGNS when I was with the government and still work with governments. We're working, I worked with Saskatchewan and Ministry of Environment for four years when you guys were getting close, 2011 to 2014. We're working with the Ontario and Quebec governments to help develop the protocols, adapt the protocols into their system as well. We do greenhouse gas quantification. We work on sustainability, McDonald's sustainable beef pilot. Uh, Canadian Roundtable and Sustainable Beef. So we've, we've done a lot in the space and we were part of the group who established when I was with government, as you read in the bio. And to date, it's been, and Drew pointed it out, it's been about $170 million investment um, through the sale of carbon credits to regulated facilities in Alberta. It's 10 years old. Do we have it right? No. Are we learning? Yes. We keep learning. We jumped in with both feet in 2007 and we keep improving the system. You gotta start somewhere. So we've heard a lot about how the world views agriculture and there's this renaissance in terms of what soil organic carbon can do um, and we are going to need that. It's all about CO2 in the atmosphere. John Bennett was absolutely right. Um, it, this is a slide that analyzes the 200 countries pledges that were done in Paris and how close we're gonna come, here's the CO2 emissions rising if we did nothing, no Paris Agreement, whatever. Here's where we wanna get to, down here at this level, to hold the climate stable, the two degrees by 2050 that our best estimates and models are telling us we need to do. If we look at some of the pledges, they're weak. We look at some other pledges, they're strong, but there's still gonna be a gap. And so the question is, how do we bridge that gap? And to me, this is where the biological sector can do that. Now we come down to Canada, and we're no different. We've got a problem, we've got a gap too. And it's a mess. You know, some of us, <laughs> Ben and I were just talking about, we were so close in 2006, and then 10 years of, of no action, and so the provinces just moved forward. And now we have a hodgepodge, we have some provinces going with just straight tax, others hybrids, you know, Alberta, BC. Then we've got Ontario and Quebec, which are gonna be strictly cap and trade. The Atlantic provinces are probably gonna form a consortium um, or, uh, and, and work together. Um, so it's a bit of a mess. And Saskatchewan, you've, you've stated in your white paper where you wanna move. Um, and Manitoba is admiring the situation right now. Um, but it is, it's a mess, and we need to solve the mess and find the right, the right position for agriculture in all of this. There's also an initiative under the Pan-Canadian framework that's gonna wrap up, a report will be due next week, and it will go to the ministers of environment in October that says, how do we harmonize what defines an offset across all of these different 
systems? What are the common weights and measures that we can apply? How do we make sure they're fungible across all of these in case there should be the need for a Saskatchewan farmer to sell an offset to a large final emitter or an industrial under the cap and trade system. So that's going to be interesting and we'll need to keep our eye on that. So some really solid analysis looking at that patchwork quilt of initiatives. How short are we going to be in Canada? And the mid case range, we're going to be short about 91 megatons. Um, in terms of what we have committed internationally in our pledge out to 2030. So again, Canada has a problem. And Minister McKenna, the Minister of the Environment, is fully aware of this, that she's going to need to mobilize not only the biological sector, but a few other things, or we will be out buying international units to comply with our accounts, our carbon accounts that we submit. You've heard this time and time again, last night and throughout the day, that agriculture and forestry is our natural advantage in Canada. You guys manage carbon and nitrogen cycles. That's what you do. And if we look at what, our anthropo what we emit as a country from all of our industries, we're sitting at about 200 megatons of carbon. Now that's carbon, not CO2, right? When we look at the size of the biological cycling, it dwarfs that. It's 10 times so higher. And so the, really the opportunities for this sector, I always call it the three R's, there's the opportunity to reduce ag emissions and Ben just did an excellent job of discussing how you can improve efficiencies, reduce inputs, reduce fuel use and et cetera, you know, and on a per output basis have lower inputs. We can also enhance our, our carbon sinks and I call that remove, that's the R, but this says enhance. Um, and we can, as Ben in his last po point there said, we can take a lot of the waste that it comes out of agriculture and forestry and we can use it to substitute a hydrocarbon with a biocarbon and a lower carbon footprint to do that. Those are our opportunities. And one of the things we do in Biological Carbon Canada, as John Bennett pointed out, is you need to quantify that. Now, is the science all there? No, but we can fall back on the great work that Brian McConkie and his collaborators do at Ag Canada to take the National Emissions Inventory Science and crunch numbers and apply sound carbon accounting principles that are the same as the IPCC. And when we do that and we look at the current opportunities for 4R nutrient stewardship on fertilizer application, we can, we can demonstrate with a fair bit of confidence that that could provide Canada with two to four million tons of CO2E reductions per year. DSM, the, the plant there in, in um, Amesburg, Iowa, was it Iowa? Yeah. So they have a new feeded additive called uh, the clean cow compound. And we've calculated that we're doing a large field trial in southern Alberta at Chinook feeders. Right now it's just been in small assessments that Karen Boschman's been doing at Lethbridge and small like 80 head of cattle to see w how well that feed ingredient will reduce enteric methane emissions from cattle. And she's found promising results between 30 and 60 percent reduction in methane emissions with a 5 to 8 percent boost in performance. So it's kind of that, that double benefit that we're looking for on the reduction in the efficiency side. You crunch the numbers on beef and dairy cattle in Canada, and that could be up to three megatons of CO2e reductions per year. It's got a ways to go. In the, the U of A rangeland stuff that Daniel presented on, um, just talking to Cam Carlisle and Ed Bork on halfway through their sites that they're measuring change in carbon on grazed sites, they're looking at 0.5% of carbon re removals reductions per year. That's significant under grazing practices. Um, and finally, we're doing some work with ducks to quantify what those wetlands and grasslands provide to Canadians, because you're going to need the numbers if you want to make the, the, the advocacy work. Um, for existing wetlands and grasslands in Alberta, they are providing seven, it's the equivalent of carbon removals of seven million cars every year. Um, and then if they were lost, Suppose we converted all those wetlands and grasslands, that could be the equivalent of up to 90 million barrels of oil. So those are the kinds of equivalencies you're going to need to talk to policymakers about. 
So in Alberta, yes, John Bennett said it's flawed. Well, it's not right yet, but we're learning and we're improving. And I wanted to show you after 10 years how we were taking those three R's and trying to create the opportunity side for growers and ranchers um, in Alberta. So if we look at the $170 million that's been you know, generated under our carbon market, most of it, I'm sorry, most of it has been from no-till agriculture. So you've got this amount here under our, our old protocol, and it's been revamped into conservation cropping. I don't have the 2017 numbers, but it has been 35% of the various opportunities. These are protocols here listed. There's bi the biologicals, so this one here is burning biomass for energy. This one here is composting. Um, there's several others that are biologically based, following the three R's. Um, and so we've seen a significant amount of carbon reduced from the biological sector when it was only $15 a ton. Now it's $30 a ton in Alberta. So the signal is stronger, and I think it will be more economic opportunities coming forward. But we can talk a little bit more about Alberta during the question period. We absolutely agree. The process can be streamlined, and I'll talk about that when I talk about Biological Carbon Canada. So we were commissioned by the cropping commissions in Alberta to help them understand the impact of the carbon levy. And when you take a look at what's going on on the farm, there's a lot of different sources and sinks of emissions of the greenhouse gases. As well, you've got the input hauling in and out of the farm, and we don't know what's going to happen with electricity. I think Tristan talked about that. That's a tough one to get a handle on. But we interviewed about 15 to 20 of their directors and said, okay, tell us what your annual farm processes look like in terms of stuff coming in, stuff coming out, what kind of trucks, so we can make an assumptions about fuel efficiency, et cetera. So we looked at these various in the green, and what we found is Tristan was absolutely right, Drew was absolutely right, natural gas is, is a, a problem. About 40% of the impact of the carbon levy came from the grain drying. We did not interview livestock operators, but they've told me, a hog operator in Westlock, that he's now facing $35,000 a year more from natural gas. And so that is an area CFA is on the right track um, for exemption. Uh, the fertilizer one, it's a bit of a question, um, but we do have these protocols that create those opportunities to be able to lighten the blow, find an opportunity for growers um, that they can use. And as I said, the conservation cropping has been utilized. NERP is new, and we're, we're working on that one. Several firms are testing it out. So there are opportunities uh, to be able to manage carbon. I was with Minister Mo, your environment minister, Wednesday night at the Stampede, and I said, Minister Mo, what do you think this audience would like to hear? And he, you guys have got to him. Ron, if you're in the audience, Eli, you've really communicated well with Minister Mo, because he gave a, a talk at a, with a group, an emissions trading group in Calgary, and he was talking up Morris Industries, the, the technology being exported to Ukraine and Russia, Australia, the CCS technologies that you have here. And he understood, he gave numbers around grasslands in Saskatchewan, and carbon sequestration in agriculture, but he said, you know, they're probably going to want to know about fertilizer. So I pulled this together. Bear with me. So in Alberta, we have, under our current regulation, they have to reduce 12% from their 2005 levels. In 2017, our fertilizer plants now were facing a 20% reduction in, in, in 2017 from their 2005 levels, and now we're in the midst of renegotiating everything because we're moving to a different system now with the NDP government, still going to be, the tar tar targets will just get tougher. That's the bottom line. Then we did the example of, okay, what if we assume we're looking at a 1160-acre farm in Canola, black soil zone, 60 kilograms of N per acre, and we worked this out with the cropping commissions, what's realistic? Um, 560 uh, cost of urea per ton, and that 60 kilograms of N per acre works out to 13 cents ton of urea per kilogram. So bear with me, these are kind of ugly numbers, whoops. But if we look at two scenarios, because right now fertilizer plants in Alberta get a methane exemption because 
They've argued it's a process-based emission. They cannot reduce those. The Haber-Bosch process is the Haber-Bosch process. And they were very successful under the Harper administration arguing same when they were going to bring in performance standards. So that burden of methane and the levy and all that will be exempt. But we, we made some, some assumptions here. So we said, okay, best case scenario, they're able to pass 50% onto the producer and the methane exemption is still in place. Of these four plants, here's the added tons they need to reduce. Here's the cost of production, the cost of the urea per ton. They pass on 50%. On average, it's six cents an acre. Worst case scenario, fertilizer company can no longer exempt methane and they pass 100% of the cost down, but we know they can't do that because you can go buy fertilizer south of the border or ne you know, next door or wherever. And so it works out to be about 31 cents per acre. Now, when they get tougher targets in 2018 under the new system, even if it goes up to 30%, which we think it will be, they're being negotiated right now, and let's say they, they get the methane exemption, which I'm pretty sure they will, this will double then, of course, to about 12 cents, let's say, and this may double, double to, you know, if they don't get the methane exemption and they pass 100% of the cost down, that may go up to 60 cents an acre, but they can't do that. So the cropping commissions wanted some realistic numbers in terms of what that would be. You can do the same for the fertilizer plants in Saskatchewan. They all report um, under Environment Canada's mandate. So you just pull the emission reductions off that reporting. So now, Biological Carbon Canada. So who are, who are we? Well, last fall there was a meeting in Calgary of about 12 or so people. There were the cropping commissions there. There was government. There were funding agencies. Uh, Agrium really has been a driver on this. And we got together and said, you know, we've got a lot of learnings in Alberta, climate leadership in agriculture in Canada. Drew said, you know, you look around, there aren't that many protocols in the world. They're mostly in Canada. So what can we do as a group to come together to influence what's happening and forming now federally and provincially? So the chair of, just formed last week, of, of Biological Carbon Canada is Nevin Rosassen. His family farms here in Saskatchewan. He works for Alberta Pulse. Um, the CEO is Graham Gilchrist. He's at the back right there. I'm a director, Don McCabe's a director, a um, couple others are directors. So we've got sort of a born in Canada solution happening. There's membership from across the country. It's growing. And you may have seen some of our press releases that came out in the end of March and April. We called ourselves the Coalition on Offset Solutions back then, um, but now we formalized into Biological Carbon Canada, and we've been making the case that agriculture's you know, activities on the ground are getting lost in the shuffle because the technology and the steel in the ground is where all the funding is, seems to be going on clean tech, but there's a lot of stuff happening above the ground. So steel above the ground, even in the air, that we need to be able to mobilize. So we've done a few, uh, a few uh, press releases. We even made the Western producer, hoo hoo. Um, and, you know, Doug's been really driving this with Agrium. And Minister McKenna gets this. She understands that agriculture is going to be a big part of the solution in bridging Canada's 91 megaton gap. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So as we sat back and started looking at everything that was happening, and Norm did a good job last night of, you know, the overview of how agriculture is being positioned in the Barton Report, and now we've got this new innovation agenda, and they want super clusters to come forward. Um, it's all in line with what we're trying to achieve by getting more efficient, but these numerous clean tech roadmaps, they're, they don't understand ag tech. They don't understand clean tech in agriculture. And oftentimes the boards that are forming around these funding agencies, and there will be more coming. There's a $1.5 billion low carbon economy fund that Mr. McKenna's department is going to announce. And so they don't have biological based people on their boards. They tend to be a lot of energy guys, you know, oil and gas and that kind of thing. And we need representation and we need a voice at the table. Um, the Pan Canadian framework document, and I encourage you to go look at it, 
They've stated in there they want 44 million tons of carbon reductions. That's about 3.8 megatons per year from the biological sectors. And here's this, a quote I took out of it about continued innovation and clean tech, but you know, that's not going to happen by itself. So where we're heading with where we need to go, and I was so glad that I heard Cecil talk yesterday about you know, that the zero till movement, the extension, the collaboration of the, the technology providers with the growers to really get that technology moved out into the, the, the landscape, that's what we need again. And there's a smart egg supercluster forming out of olds. You may have heard about it. Um, they want to submit a proposal to the federal government for smart egg. Call this what you will, systems-based smart egg. You know, you call it what you will. But it really is these precision guided things that Ben talked about. It's sustainable beef systems. It's the for our nutrient stewardship where the outcome of all of this is you're getting improved profitability or yield per unit of input. And you're also getting these environmental goods and services, call it carbon, there's lots more and we need to get there that are happening at the same time. And we n we've heard from John Bennett and others, and you've been around tables where the Unilevers of the world, the General Mills, the PepsiCo, they would like those kinds of metrics for their, their goals that they've set on greenhouse gases as well. The federal government completely, in their discussions around the Pan-Canadian framework, forgot this component. And that's a very important component on moving forward and achieving that bridging of the gap, if you will. Just a couple slides now. I was hopeful that I would please most of the people at my table by having a red piece of equipment here. I only got halfway there, but hey, you can't win them all. And the one lady was saying, well, I don't know, but she said, I'll give it to you red. But anyway, here's some stuff from the American Farm Bureau. Oops, sorry. While Ben was talking about, you know, the, the whole precision, GPS guided sectional control and all the good things that are happening with today's farm equipment, in the American Farm Bureau, they're seeing these increases in, in yield, but Ben, you s quoted some pretty good numbers about decreased inputs. Put those two together, and it's pretty exciting. Plus, I think we saw in, in um, the discussions around uh, uh, Cecil's thing on precision ag and the potential that could be there, it does have large potential. And these things are important because what governments want is assurance that Things have happened on the farm. If we want to quantify this, we also have to verify. And so we need cheaper ways of doing that than sending somebody out to the farm to measure a piece of farm implement or a spacing on a no-till drill. And there are systems being developed that can look at, from an optical satellite point of view, the residue left on the soil and determine if that was a one pass or a second pass. Cover crops they can determine. Drones can confirm that. And so we have a, a burgeoning technology data robotics thing here that could make carbon way cheaper to do. So I was asked by the sponsors to talk about what's needed. Biological Carbon Canada is working on these four areas. Um, we feel they're very important. So we need to reduce carbon cheaper, streamline things, and sustained investment. Because if we're talking about a big fund that does a one-time project, funds it, and then that's it, we've done that, gone on. No, because the activities are happening on the landscape all the time. We need a price signal either through a market or recycled revenues that are put into agriculture on a sustained basis so these things can happen every year, right, to incentivize it. We need to maximize and scale across the landscapes, and we need to invest in R&D. We need more measurable science with existing BMPs and because we've been too conservative and we can't link greenhouse gas reductions to all of them. So yes, for PSCB2, absolutely need it. We need more work like what Rich is doing and Reynold. And we need enhanced science and research to find new reduction and removal opportunities, either to create new protocols or make that causal link that can be quantified. And then we need the verification systems to verify that those measured carbon reductions happened. And it's out there. 
We're working with Monsanto and the National Corn Growers in the U.S., and they have developed those systems to, to verify the practices that have gone on the ground through the optical satellites, and we'll be testing them on 113 sites on the Soil Health Partnership across the I states and a few others. So I'm going to wrap it there. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you are interested in Biological Carbon Canada, you can talk to Graham. You can pick up the phone and call Nevin Rosassen. You can talk to me. I think there's power in numbers, as John Bennett had said. Well, thank you, Karen and, and uh, Ben, for those presentations. Um, just while people are thinking up their questions and going to the mic, I wanted to tell my own accident. I don't know if it was a Morris spring tooth cultivator that I walked on when I was four or not, but, but I got my scar across the top of my nose from equipment at a young age as well, and chances are it was an or original Morris. So what I'd like you to do now is um, we have time for questions and our speakers have been very succinct. So uh, we have lots of time for questions actually on our schedule. So uh, please proceed to the mic and ask your question. Uh, when you're recognized, please state your name and who you're with, who you represent, and which panelists you are posing the question for and uh, to accommodate as many questions as possible. Let's pose one question at a time and then take your seat and if there's more time, you can come back for another question. So, we'll start over here. My name's Devin Walker with RM Wilton. Um, you mentioned that even with our best efforts, Canada would be at a 91 metric, 91 million ton excess of carbon emissions, correct? Okay, so um, you said we'd have to purchase international offsets. So I'm not necessarily poking this question at you because you might have the answer to it, but if Canada is one of the most developed countries in the world and we sit in rooms like this with all these researchers and most people are like, well, we don't have solid numbers on what we can sequester <laughs> and what we do as growers, what other international body, country, research group has those numbers that we can buy from them? If we have to shore up 91 million tons of carbon that we're producing here and we can't even figure out what we're storing here, who has the answer? What country? And why aren't we copying their plan? Uh, and if we do buy those tons from their plan or whatever they say they are offsetting for us, uh, how do we know it's legit? How do we know it's real? Um, is it, is it valid? Is it on a one-on-one -on -one basis, like some guy owns a nature preserve in Africa and he wants to sell carbon offsets and that's what he sets and we agree with him? Who audits that I in the event that we get that far? Good, good questions. So there's gonna be a shortage, no doubt. You saw John Bennett have his slide up when he had a big question mark on China, right? If they wanna be you know, a big generator or, or a big purchaser of offsets, the question is, what are the rules around what those offsets are? How are they defined? And that's an article in the Paris Accord card, uh, called Article 6. And Catherine McKenna is one of the chairs of the Article 6. They have a few years to draft that and figure out what those common weights and measures are going to be so that what defines an international tradable mitigation outcome, right? that's what they're called right now, ITMOs, um, are yet to be determined. But your question is a valid one in terms of the biological. If, if we have this advanced accounting and measurement, how are other countries going to be you know, generating them from the biological sector? They may not all come from the biological sector. They may come from other sectors. But those rules are being defined and it's gonna take a while and a lot of discussion on how those are going to apply and what will count. Mike, Bob Kennedy with the Alberta Federation of Agriculture. And my question's for both panelists in, in that our uh, carbon sequestration seems to be dependent on our conservation farming and zero tillage. 
what's their comment on the seeming trend to uh, to broadcasting fertilizer and new tillage tools that seem to become available? Thank you. That's a good good question. I I know. Uh, my dad always laughs when he calls it vertical tillage because it's like plowing, <laughs> you know. But, uh, you know, a lot of it is driven by farmer timing and just shortage of time, and they need to get this stuff done. And uh, if if the practices don't orient to conservation agriculture, they're not going to get the reductions, and the and the soil carbon sequestration is not going to occur. Uh, because tillage is going to directly affect that. Uh, I, th I think probably there's still some argument that crop rotations have a pretty significant impact on, on soil carbon, especially the legume rotations that we've now seen a significant pickup in, in, in Western Canada. But, uh, you know, I think it's probably, it's always an economic question more than it is a, an ecological one. So if, if farmers are going to be adopting fertilizer broadcasting stock because they don't want to conserve carbon, it's because they're trying to just keep their margins intact. And so I, I don't know if this has been discussed, but I mean, I remember this going back in the early days of this kind of, well, if somebody would pay the farmer for the carbon credits, they would change their practice, you know? And I'm sure that's been a lovely and not controversial topic here at all, but you know, the. The, the idea would be, okay, yeah, if, you, if, if broadcasting fertilizer is going to increase my nitrous oxide emissions uh, and somebody says, if you don't do that, I'll pay you a little money, I might do it a different way. I, but, but tillage practices, I mean, uh, kind of the return of tillage, if you want to call it that, has been you know, driven somewhat by the wet years, somewhat by some of these new opportunities, but um, I, th I think it just goes through its processes so. yeah i think the question was raised by haley about how we do we move forward on a policy framework that works and i think the key is flexibility um we've been you know the work that brian and and the soil management technical working group did on the no-till protocol back in 2006 it allowed for flexibility for the odd tillage sure maybe you didn't get as much carbon you know um, but the flexibility was there. We can accommodate it. Uh, broadcasting, um, you know, I understand you're broadcasting a coated, a coated fertilizer. If you think the conditions are dry enough that you're not going to lose that, I think there's a role for that. And so we need to think about what are the flexible systems and the conditions that are, are conducive to making sure that we're not going to lose some of that nitrous oxide or lose some of the nitrogen fertilizer to nitrous oxide emissions. And so I think it's about designing the the, whether it's an incentive program, a sustained payment for success, or it's a market, is to build in that flexibility. Tom? Brown, 499. Uh, I think my question is probably directed to Karen. It concerns aggregators. One of the previous presentations indicated that probably the aggregators are going to take 50% of this. Can the system work if the aggregators are taking 50%? Thank you for your question. Um, well, Drew didn't quite have his stats right, because uh, I've been <laughs> watching the market, advising the market, helping for in the market. When Alberta Systems started out 10 years ago, we must have had 15 or 16 different companies in the marketplace um, vying for acres. Uh, and you know, once the system settled down, it was, it was maybe 70%. 80% sometimes if it got competitive, back to the producer. So it's not 50%. Today, in today's market, we only really have two viable ones and one that's really moving and, and dabbling with co-implementation of a couple protocols. And so it's still going to hover around the 70 to 60% back to the grower on the sale of the carbon. And Graham's in the, in the room. Graham worked a lot with these guys at the Farmer's Advocate Office. And he, uh, he's very intimate with you know, the situation out there in the countryside. So you can speak to Graham afterwards, too, because um, he is um, on contract with one of the aggregators. Um, so he's right on the ground. So he knows what the contracts look like. 
Do we have any more questions? Hi, Haley with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. Um, in terms of investments and sustained financing for this kind of work, whether it be through revenue recycling from carbon pricing or some other means, how much are we talking, um, in t either in absolute terms or in as a percentage of revenue collected or, or emissions? And who should that money be going to, industry or academics or producers? Well, Haley, I wish we knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, I, think, I think with the, the investment that's going to need to go forward into research, there's going to have to be policy research, like, like Cecil pointed out yesterday. You know, policy research, socioeconomic research, like, let's understand what that cost has to be, right? I know the Smart Egg Supercluster is looking at the, the gaps in the implementation in some of these emerging, you know, smart agriculture systems and what needs to be funded in order to sort of get those pinch points, you know, passed so that there's, there's more smooth deployment, let's say, of those integrated technologies that we need to be able to extend, demonstrate, you know, follow the models that have been done with RT linkages um, and SSCA here in the province of Zero Till. And so I think those will emerge. Um, the Co Biological Carbon Canada wants to work on a business case. We're working closely with the Smart Ag Supercluster out of Olds just to determine what some of those costs are. Um, but we're a long ways from that. Todd. Lew Todd Lewis with APAS. Uh, just to start with, uh, certainly, uh, Ben, thank you very much on behalf of APAS for your sponsorship for Morris. We've had uh, lots of industry partners and for you guys to step up here and be our major sponsor is really appreciated. And, and thanks for sitting up on our panel too, that's great. Um, just, you know, as you sit here and, you know, I look at, uh, it, it's frustrating in some ways, you know, like John says, it's about the CO2 in the air. But, you know, for us guys sitting here on the ground and as producers in general, you know, when you get a, a 91 megaton here or whatever that number is that we're going to be short, that seems very measurable. The CO2 in the air is very measurable. But, on a, you know, what we're going to be charged and what, you know, every time we do something, you know, this is what you're emitting. And you're not, there's no, you know, practices and everything else. It's, it's assumed this is what we're emitting. And here's the number. And, but the, that's science, very exact. But the exact science of what we're storing and how we're, you know, where's the argument there? And, it's, and that's, that's, you know, like it's like you in your presentation, we're going to be able to cut into that 91 tons or megatons, but how are we going to get there? And that's, you know, that's the frustrating part for producers. You know, it's being said, we're, you, you are producing this much, but that's an exact science, but what's in the air that we're causing seems exact, but what we're keeping isn't exact. So just a statement. That's why we need Prairie Soil Carbon Balance Project too, across the prairies. Yeah, if there's anyone else, please come to the mic. In the meantime, in your package, you will have received a magazine called Innovate, and uh, when you have time uh, after speakers are done and at home relaxing, make sure you leave through it because this is from the Morris Company. My name, my name is Scott Owens from the RM of Eldon. I'm with APAS. Uh, my question's for Ben uh, in reference to ethanol in particular. Uh, I farm in the northwest and uh, we have a husky grain ethanol plant and uh, ADM has a canola crushing plant that makes biodiesel. So Essentially, all of the wheat I grow gets turned into ethanol, and all the canola, or about half the canola I grow gets turned into biodiesel. So, my farm relies heavily on ethanol policy, and uh, Richard Gray pointed to it yesterday that all producers, I think, generally have benefited from an ethanol policy in the States. I've always had a notion that. Um, that grain-based ethanol was kind of a short-term solution and that cellulose-based ethanol would take over in time because it's such a cheap feedstock in comparison with grain. But there was uh, problems with just the nuts and bolts of 
making ethanol out of a really strong cell, like a cellulose type cell. Uh, is there been a major breakthrough or is it just they're chipping away at it slowly? Uh, just some of your thoughts. Uh, yeah, it's a great question and uh, when you're right, when ethanol was first announced in Saskatchewan, I think that was the, the point is that we'd start with grain and eventually evolve. Uh, the, there are three facilities in the U.S. I only I'll, I'll provided one uh, example. All of them used a slightly different design approach. Du, DuPont is one, uh, has one of the facilities and they were really uh, involved in the enzyme development and the, the science around conversion. Uh, the facility that's in Sarnia, Ontario that's just been announced and is going to be constructed is probably the one that's the most leading edge and, and I would say has a breakthrough science. And that's in the, the enzymatic process, the way they can break the cellulosic carbon chain down into its subcomponents to then produce a sugar through a secondary type process. You know, it's not the yeast fermentation that we're used to seeing with wheat, which is our traditional alcohol <coughs> production, but it's more of a, a biological and chemical process to get those those uh, fractions out of the feedstock. And, um, and because it's universally a, a useful in corn or wheat or other forms of straw, it allows it to be very, a little more economic because it, you know, one of the things that has affected viability is, is if you have a, a, a change in yield of corn biomass and then you can't put wheat in its place, well then you're really stuck if you have a, a drought or something occurs. So the, the, the hope is that this facility in Sarnia is going to lead to many more. And, and I know we've heard this before, the Iogen story and other things, but the, ultimately they have to get off the ground commercially and they have to be able to, to make a profit and pay some 15, 20 bucks a ton to the producer for their straw. I mean, you take, the, take the straw off the land, you're taking fertilizer. You know, that's a problem. So you need more fertilizer then, which is another greenhouse gas. <laughs> so there's, there's still a, a chain effect there, but uh, you know, if the farmer's giving it away, it doesn't work. Um, and uh, at the same time, the, the facility can't be overly subsidized. Because what we see happening at ethanol now, right? No subsidy, are you, are you gonna make money, any money? And then you got these contracts to sell wheat that, that aren't worth anything. So, uh, you know, I'm, I am an advocate. I think that we need to have more of these types of facilities built that take a risk and prove that you can do it at a commercial scale. Because if we don't try it, we don't experiment with it, we're never gonna get past the scientific barriers. But uh, this, this project in Ontario is exciting. And they got a lot of producer support. They formed a co-op. The co-op is putting up a bunch of commitments. They, that's helped them get it financed. So, uh, you know, and it's an international deal because there's an Italian connection on the technology side and it's kind of a made in Canada solution, but, you know, they've learned a lot from the American experience too. So I'm encouraged, but, you know, it's, it, and, you know, Saskatchewan's right in the crosshairs on this. Uh, it, we got a lot of straw, <laughs> so there's a lot of potential eventually. But, you know, the logistics side and all that is, I think, worked out. It's, it's can we economically convert that tough molecule into the, the outputs that are worth something. We have another question. Hi, uh, Rick Swenson, RM131. I, I, I really fear in this whole process, and I, I want your opinion, that we're going to make decisions that, uh, because we're going to try and solve the carbon problem that aren't going to make very much economic sense and, and, and I'll give you an example and I'd like your comment because about 14 years ago or maybe it's longer than that some nutcase filled a truck full of 3400 and dumped diesel fuel on it and blew up a government building in Oklahoma we got it taken away from us okay I as an irrigator I used that all the time because I could spread it and then water it in at my leisure or wait for a rain but it didn't gas off okay it didn't contribute to the problem. So we all switched to 46 or some other form and, and God knows we gassed off lots of it, okay? Because we got that other tool taken away. So the stroke of a pen, government took away 3400. 
In Ontario, I think they still get to use it because they changed it to 32 and a half or something like that. You know, and we had some guys running around Toronto that were going to do the same thing. But instead of making an example out of the nut cases, you take away 3400 from agriculture, create all kinds of carbon footprint, and nobody's willing to reverse it. So they take the tools away. And, and I see some of the same kind of nonsense coming down the pipe with this thing, with this arbitrary number that they've picked, and we're, we're not solving the problem. So I, just an example, I'd like your comment. <laughs> I like 3400, but I mean, you're right. I, I, don't know, I don't know all the details as far as why uh, ammonium nitrate can't be produced safely for, for farmers to use and, uh, and avoid the terror risk of an explosive being derived out of it. Um, and, and the fertilizer industry is probably where that needs to be solved because uh, I think the production benefits out of it would be high so I agree with you on that um, but I don't know I don't know why the industry has uh, hasn't been able to figure out a way to, to move past just urea and other other forms of nit nitrogen that are obviously problematic for volatilization problems I'm not sure was it a government regulation or was it a voluntary industry thing I I've been told it was a, a voluntary industry thing that the manufacturers just wouldn't make that. That's what I've been told, but I don't, I'm not an expert on this. Um, so I, I can't comment. Um, as to, you see stupid decisions being made? It could happen. That's why I think it's really, really important to have more conversations like this and to influence where you can once you start understanding where things could go. And I think that um, your premier wants to take a level course here. Um, your minister of environment, based on my conversations with him, he values agriculture, he values what you guys do. I think you have an opportunity here to be able to influence so that you have a reasonable and practical approach to this in Saskatchewan? Well, I'm, uh, if it's one more quick question, it will be the last one. Uh, that was a pretty good conclusion as it was, and then I, oh, I've got another question. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, and uh, congratulations to both of you and on your presentation this afternoon. Um, my name is Zenith Fay, and I'm with the uh, Barley uh, Commission here in the province. But I also have a history of the biodiesel industry of having my head bashed against the wall for a long time in this province. And as a result of <clears throat> that background, um, I think as a farmer, uh, we, the rubber hits the road at our driveway. And I guess, you know, we have problems uh, with sustainability and sustainability to me means profitability throughout the industry, including the end user all the way down to the producer. But as Todd had indicated and other presenters have indicated here today, or questionnaires have asked, when that rubber hits the road, in your best guesstimate, how do we as producers uh, pass on that cost? I'm, all, I'm a part of a, just as a little bit of background, I'm, I'm part of a, a group on a sustainability program with uh, an old group, a buyer, and <clears throat> Eight hours of filling out forms um, takes a lot out of a person. And it, sure, the next year it took me four hours, and this year it may take me three. I don't know. But if every company is going to ask me to do that on my farm, we have to have some way of having a, a, a joint way of appeasing uh, the consumer or the commercial buyer of our products. Because at the end of the day, we too have to not only spend all those, t all those hours at, at the desk filling out uh, forms. So I hope that whatever we come through in, in the carbon part of it also has that ability to reduce the paperwork, not increase the paperwork. So just general comments, if you could, please. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a great, great question uh, or comment on, in terms of uh, uh, our business relies on farmers being profitable. If they're not, we don't sell any equipment. So it's um, 
I'm the first guy that's excited about that. Is is can can we find ways for farmers to to have better margins and administrative costs and and the extra impact that technology is having, good and bad impact, is is all part of that. And I. I, I can't see, unfortunately, I can't see a way that with all this increased exposure that the industry is going to have to these, uh, whether it's the carbon side or other regulation, yeah, sustainability needs to be documented or, or it's, it's not going to be proven. And uh, so the, the industry has to find a way to make it easier for the farmer. I don't know how, how that would occur, but I, as a producer myself, I, I go through this too, and I, the paperwork is getting worse every year. Completely agree with you. It's more complex, and there's more oversight, and there's consequences if it isn't accurate. And, uh, and, and I'm trying to use technology to help me, but it isn't always easy. So if, uh, if I was, if I take off my Morris hat for a minute and put on my, my farming hat, I'm looking at is the equipment and is the uh, is the the agronomic services and are all the supply chain going to come with me to help me figure out how to keep my records as simple and easy as possible so that when I have to pr produce it for my customer or my oversight body whatever that is it, that I can do it easily so you know whether it's crop insurance forms being the same as the forms that you need for another agency so that it's all one standardized method while well, that would make life easier wouldn't it you know but that part of, of farming has to I got I used to live in Europe and I worked for a farmer in Germany I mean you, you have no idea what they go through like the oversight like day of fertilization is regulated right you can't fertilize only on this Saturday then you can fertilize <laughs> and you fill out a form to do that right so it's not a not a system I'm hoping we get to, <laughs> but that that you know system we've enjoyed for a long time, the freedom we've enjoyed for a long time, is is something that we have to adapt, I guess. I'll just respond quickly. I think John Bennett said it right. He said, "Make sure the policy fits agriculture." But we do know that there is this data-driven side that's coming. That you know, you got the data plug on the tractor, um, there should be, it should be easier, it should, it's gonna take a while, this is gonna be an adoption curve, just like no-till was, and, and we're, are we gonna be there tomorrow? No, are we gonna be there in the future? Yes, will it take four years, five years, six years, but with, with investment, like Cecil said, and extension and, and collaboration uh, to get these new systems off the ground, it should get easier. I know that's not the answer you wanna hear, but there are several groups that are saying that that's going to be the way of the future. And maybe it's not keeping paper records anymore. Well, th thank you very much uh, uh, to the both of you for your presentations. And uh, we're going to move on in our agenda now. Um, so Ken and uh, Ben and Karen, not Ken and <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome.